question. Um, what is in question is whether the people in power want to do something about that tenuous relationship. I guess my uh, take on it is, Tracy kind of took the first few words out of my mouth that depends on who it is. Because um, even with some blacks, it depends on who they are, what position they have, their fluency in the community, or um, a lot of times up on campus. Um, so I, I think that that's, it just depends on who you're talking to, um, on on what it, um, sorry, I was about to sneeze. <laughs> uh, it, it just depends on who you're talking to and whether or not um, they're in agreement with it or totally disagree with um, the city's uh, decision. So I will add that one way to help on this is I think in many ways, uh, black people in, the, in this community are often looked at as a monolith, um, like we're all the same. And yes. it's a very stark class um, differences in this town and uh, the different impressions that go with that, um, which is also problematic. So um, I think it's a good, idea, as I said, that there are many different identities um, at stake here. I do, I do think it's fair to say that um, our low-income Black communities, um, historically Black areas, are both over-policed and under-policed at the same time. I think that's a fair assessment. All right, and then uh, yeah, just so you know, I know you'd be doing a second ago. I'll, first of all, thank you for uh, taking the time to come on here. And then basically, I'm just kind of going through a list of questions. Uh, whatever ones you want to answer, you can. Basically, it's, it's kind of just up to you. So, but yeah, thank you for uh, taking the time to answer some questions. Sure. Uh, what was the question? Well, one thing I'd like to um, add to that is that we gave them a list of people they sent in emails. Um, or spoke at city council in regards to the chokehold or if they had been chokehold. But the thing is, is that the police, they don't report it. So they said that they've never done it um, from my understanding. So that's part of um, the problem as well. Well, I think another part of the problem is, and I don't know if you know this, Ben, but I sent a letter to um, Race Matters Friends and a letter to the mayor on October, for the October 18th or 17th meeting where the chokehold was first brought up and asked a series of questions about use of force um, around the use of force annual reports from 2016 to 2019. Um, at that meeting, the mayor said that he would follow up and uh, with a thoughtful response. And even though I have reminded him several times, he has not responded. So beyond just looking at chokehold, um, we're also not looking at um, their use of force. Um, Gina Hale presented some information the other night at our well, Sunday night at our at our meeting, and one of the things that she talked about, one of the disparities was um, the reason that people were in jail were for arrest um, based on rules and procedures, right? That there's a huge disparity there between black folks were arrested for rules and procedures versus white folks. And she also noted that two people were in, in jail for not having uh, an updated or appropriate fishing license, right? So rules and procedures is the place where the police have the most discretion to not give a ticket, right? Um, another thing that shows up in the use of force reports is that um, they've stopped reporting how many times they um, handcuff people but don't arrest them because those numbers were, you know, they're doing that a couple hundred times a year. So they sort of backdated the rules in 2019 so they didn't have to report in 2018 or 2019 how many people they were handcuffing and not arresting. Um, so, you know, the chokehold to me is really emblematic of their use of force practices where they are basically, um, not even investigating themselves, but um, you know, they get to make the rules, and um, there's no accountability. Not 
you know, they won't accept accountability from us, but there's no um, institutional accountability for the outcomes that they pr produce that are desperate. So the fact that they could have said, hey, we don't use the chokehold, but we're, we're going to, to do this as a demonstrate a demonstration of our understanding and respect for the for the black communities um, uh, feelings about this um, considering all that's happened and given the fact that our um, outcome data <laughs> uh, doesn't support that we uh, you know treat black people very good they could have done that and would have built a bridge of trust but they punted on that so um, I don't know where they go from there, but they don't seem to ha have a deep investment in um, being reflective or holding themselves accountable in any way that they might feel uncomfortable. It's okay for the public to be uncomfortable, but it's not okay for them to be uncomfortable. And that, I, that is something that as we've done research into like looking for things like that, that is something that we found is that it's, it's kind of, it, it's not really there. So I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up. It just kind of what we were seeing when we were doing research. Um, I also wanted to know a little bit more. Can you guys tell me just a little bit more about what you guys is it like group do? Kind of give me a background on that a little bit. So there's a lot in your morgue. You guys should be able to look on our website and Google us. But um, we are a 5013C. Um, we are education oriented. So our position on things like the chokehold is to engage our elected officials in dialogue about their policy and their practices. So on the dozen, uh, we, we don't just focus on the police, we also look at the school district. And we also have popped up on various issues that come before the council. Um, one of those uh, come to mind quickly was the Midway extension, right? We said, hey, you're gonna give this person a subsidy, but that person doesn't live in this community. They're not part of Columbia. You're, you're giving benefits to someone who doesn't contribute to our tax base. So, um, you know, we see other things happen in terms of equity, in terms of planning and development, that we say that we have all these rules that we want to have affordable housing and we care about the environment, but we approve projects that don't uh, don't adhere to any of, our, of those values. So whether it's the Community Housing and Development Commission, which disperses money and it's not done equitably because they have no equity tools to decide how to give out money or um, you know approvals of projects that further um, devalue people's uh, neighborhood because they don't take uh, environmental concerns um, into consideration and in fact we don't have an environmental review process at all in Colombia so again it's about um, equity and um, it it is not something that is an institutional practice in Columbia. Um, um, go ahead. No, no, what, what, what were you gonna say? Well, she's gonna ask a question. I was just gonna introduce myself. Oh yeah, no, I would I would love to hear every every piece of information that you guys have, so. Um, How much time you well, got? My, my name is Erica, I am the uh, VP uh, People's Defense, we started last year after the George Floyd um, murder. And so we, we're we in the process of getting our 501c3 because along with the chokehold, we kind of are the ones that introduced the chokehold to uh, Rory Lovelady, who's the president, um, to the city council and to the Citizens Review Board. Um, so we're we're we have like 18 different things that are on our list and i can't name them all at this moment but um as far as educating the police and the public um so we have that and then we also have um i guess i'm, I'm in the community i've been in the community for a long time uh just as a community advocate if i see things or hear things, then I basically research before I go and uh, check with people to see, okay, how can we get this change? Something needs to be improved here. I am active with the Columbia City, uh, uh, Columbia Public Schools, as far as making sure that a lot of the families uh, that can't get to the meetings or can't get 
uh, they don't have tax uh, because a lot of people that think just because they're on their cell phones that they have that access to the internet or are familiar with uh, Facebook. You would be surprised how many families are not on Facebook or that kind of social media. Um, and that, to me, that is not making this community an inclusive community or equi equitable community. Um, and so th those are my primary things in uh, the youth, uh, dealing with the youth, because one thing that we're looking at trying to do is not only the chokehold uh, problem, but also uh, having uh, the youth and I can't even just say the youth, letting people know their rights in um, when they're stopped by the police or what what they their rights are when they're encounter a certain problem, even if it's in a store uh, or on someone else's property. Uh, just a lot of people don't know. They just want to just, oh, well, I'll just let it just go or I'll just let it slide or want to take it into their own hands when there's actually a lot of things that are uh, you can legally um, work towards, you know, making your life better, uh, getting a solution or re resolution to something. So, um, but yeah, I'm, just, I'm in the community just to make sure that the community is aware of a lot of things. That's, that's truly, truly fantastic. I wrote, I wrote down a lot of stuff you're saying. For <laughs> I will make sure to include, but no, that's fantastic. I think as a, as a rejoinder to what she said, I think it's, um, I mean, we know this, we've seen the national data, but a lot of low income families, particularly rural families, don't have access to high speed internet. Um, you know, we, that's a very middle class thing to have access to the internet um, on your desktop. Um, I'm not talking about using your phone to do major work, right? Um, so a lot of people don't have that kind of access because it's expensive. Um, and so it, that was something that revealed itself with COVID. We have a lot of families that are not able to access um, school materials because they don't have um, high-speed internet um, and uh, um, what they pay for. So they have to go places where there's a hotspot. And eventually, I think the school districts will start creating some hotspot areas. We also encourage this Parks and Recreation Department to use their park spaces to create hotspot boxes so that people could um, have access, particularly students who were showing up some of the schools and and you know getting online outside um, because they don't have internet um, at home. So that that's a that's a, an equity issue that we shouldn't have been blindsided by. But again, since we don't pay attention to um, you know equity those things get overlooked. And, and to piggyback off of that, <laughs> the, um, because I am out in the community, one thing that was a problem, and I, tried, I kept trying to get the uh, CPS to understand, was you all, since a lot of the people were affected by COVID, that meant that the middle class and the upper class that lost their jobs, but were filing for free lunch, they were getting, and so they actually already had information on how to get the hotspots. And so the hotspots that were supposed to be for the normal free lunch, um, I guess, it, I don't know if that's the correct word to use, but the ones that are normally on free lunch, they missed out on that opportunity. So they had to get more hotspots because all the hotspots were taken. And they, they seem to think that was okay. And I'm just like, it's not okay. You need to get more in here. And you, and, I'm, and, and I know you're young, but one thing you'll learn um, when communicating with some of us older black or educated uh, or woke black and white or other races is, is that we believe in equity, not equality. And there's a big difference. And even getting blacks to understand it is challenging because we want more than just being equal. Uh, so uh, it's, it's something that you may know, you may be familiar with, 
but it's something that if your class is trying to understand some of the issues um, that are going on just in Columbia or um, with city council, the police or whatever, um, those are those are two words that you may want to make sure that your class is aware of and, and to use them. So I would say that um, I'll make this a little bit eggheadish. That feminism is really about <laughs> everyone is included, right? I mean, that's what feminism was about. Feminism as mainstream culture is about treating everyone the same. <laughs> Equity is about meeting people where they're at. And black feminists believe you don't leave anybody behind, especially people who are marginalized and, and vulnerable. That's a really different uh, perspective of taking care of the community, that you think about people who are the most marginalized, the most vulnerable first, um, they're in the center. Um, we're not campaigning to get treated the same as white men because we would still not be treated equitably. So, um, and that's, 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 no. uh, it's a very, it's a very difficult conversation because a lot of people think that we're all treated the same and that we're all the same. And um, that is that is not true. That's why I said earlier, black people are not a monolith demographic. Um, they come from all walks of life, just like white people do. Um, but as a small, um, as a smaller populist of the, of the country, um, because of the history of segregation and Jim Crow and um, anti-blackness, we there are systemic and institutional barriers that um, prohibit um, black people and black communities from you know aspiring similarly. So one of those ways this works out when we talk about policing in particular is the way that black communities are not invested in right um, the amenities, um, the services, um, the priorities are not the same. And you know, uh, violence isn't just something that happens; um, it's bred out of neglect. And so, this is why, and, and Erica is really good about bringing this up. You know, if we don't invest in these communities that we've neglected as a policy practice, they're not going to get better just because the police are nice to them. It costs money to backfill and neglect. And a lot of our politicians don't want to do that. Um, for reasons that they don't really articulate very well, but um, those communities are not a, not a priority. Just for a quick example, um, we know that people of color are dying at a three times rate of COVID. The city just hired a consultant to do outreach for COVID. So did anyone ask any questions about how they were gonna reach out to people of color in the community? No, wasn't asked at all. So there's, there's, they're contributing to hampering inclusion and equity because they don't ask the question about who needs to be, who needs to be um, prioritized in this conversation in this particular action or investment. No, that's, that, um, I'm glad you shared that with me because that's not, obviously there's, there's stuff like that that I just don't know and stuff that we're finding out as we do this story. There's four of us working on it. So, right. That's a really important one that Erica brought up about equity and equality. Equality is sameness. It's like we can all go to school, right? But we don't all have the same resources at our schools, depending on this place and space that we're in. We are, you know, resources really are divvied up based on your identity. Yeah. Hold on one second. Just put my purse on, get in my car, and move it. Because <laughs> my fob is in my purse. Um, so that's really important. And you'll see some graphs online. You can look at both equity versus equality, right? So um, another good example to use is if um, I'm teaching in a class and I have some kids who are deaf 
or I have some kids who are blind, I'm not going to treat them the same as my students who are seeing, right? Because they're deaf and blind. So they need different things to succeed. So um, when we write public policy, we need to be um, mindful of the different needs that people have because they don't all have the exact same needs and they haven't all been treated the same historically. I mean, it's just like at the Community and Housing Development Commission meeting, one of the commissioners said he didn't know that food scarcity was an issue in Colombia. I don't know how, I don't, I don't know how that happened, that this person doesn't know that, but it's a huge problem. So um, they just think everyone has got the same stuff. And um, even though there's lots and lots of information out there that would tell them otherwise, we didn't know that. So that's where I, we start talking about privilege, right? So your identity can um, hamper your ability to know how other people live because your identity doesn't, um, isn't marginalized in the same way, right? So he just didn't know. I don't know why he's on the commission. He should be kicked off or he should do some radical education on the people on the commission. But his ignorance leads to them not being able to disperse money equitably to organizations in the community because they don't know that those issues exist and they don't know what the needs of um, the various community identity groups are. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yep. So the chokehold ends up being symbolic of the way that, that the police department thinks of the black community. They're, an afterthought and something that they need to control for themselves, power that they want to have for themselves. They're not thinking about building relationships. They're not thinking about building bridges. They're not thinking about the history of their relationship. They're not thinking about how they're going to invest in the community. So that they're sending a message that they're aware that they over police the black community and under police. Um, their answer today demonstrates that they have a tin ear to that. Um, if you don't mind me asking, Chad, I would just love to hear a little bit kind of like your involvement with uh, this organization and just kind of your, your thoughts. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what was the, um, the, the primary question that you were asking initially? Because <laughs> I, like, I, I kind of came in, you guys are already having a discussion, so. Basically, basically what I brought up um, initially was kind of just the relationship between the community and then law enforcement and city council, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, more specifically, like the black community, that's kind of, so basically when we started researching for the story, it was more just the chokehold then, but then it kind of turned into, that's just a piece of it. And we were looking at the relationship between the community and like the city and the police as mm -hmm. a whole, if that makes sense. Okay. Um I'm going to back up a little bit um, to some of the comments I heard previously, um, some of the questions you had asked earlier, too. Um, the, the big programs that we're looking at right now with Race Matters Friends is like we do have the bail fund. Uh, because, you know, when, when you think about like the incarceration rates, that is also a direct reflection of how law enforcement operates. So if law enforcement is pulling over people at two and a half times the ratio and the courts are, um, you know, also biased, which, by the way, surprise, they are. Um, we're talking about 400% bias on a lot of things like uh, like how long individuals are kept in detention or what their fines are, what their penalties are. Um, as far as like who even shows up in prison um, is, is, again, three to four times um, the representation of, of black members of this community. Um, and, you know, it, it, here's, here's kind of the insidious thing, you know, um, you know, talking about the whole equity and equality thing, I think it's very, very important to frame a lot of this discussion. Um, I'm also going to kind of steal from um, kind of popular, um, I guess, culture now in terms of this discussion is that, you know, anti-racism is an approach that, you know, our organizations and institutions need to adopt. And until that happens, none of anything that we do is going to be other than um, fighting against, I, th I think, like a very entrenched mindset and group of people who like things the way it is. Um, and they don't want to see this change. Um, and I, I think it's, I think it's kind of, um, it, it's really sick and disgusting on so many levels, but when we talk about like, for example, the school to prison pipeline, I'm just kind of curious, this is not to put you on the spot or anything, but can you name 
Um, basically, what organizations that touches on? Does that phrase mean anything to you? Um, I cannot. I'm not. I'm not really. Sure. Okay. Um, the, the whole idea is that you know once you have kids that are school age, you know they're they're by state mandate. But this is like some of the first time a lot of these kids come into contact with law enforcement or they come into uh, the criminal justice system uh, for any number of reasons. And the, the more that we adopt like a zero tolerance profile, which Columbia Public Schools has adopted a zero tolerance um, for the most part, they're, they're very um, strict into crony and, and go figure they're also three to four times more likely to pick on either special needs children or black children or uh, children of color. So once you start penalizing the people at the schools, and you look at, like, say, the truancy officers and the juvenile courts, put them in exposure to law enforcement and to the, the court systems. So much easier for the systems to keep an eye on them. And so as, as they're progressing through life, um, you know, no matter where you are, from elementary school te- or kid, we had a seven-year-old black kid that was handcuffed and transported by Columbia Police Department because he had a behavioral disorder. And this cop traumatized him. I mean, the whole show of just display of power traumatized them. And, you know, it, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, and the cop and, and, and the school actually, and the other part of the school prison pipeline is that the schools call in the police to fix their mm-hmm. problems, right? Their behavior problems. And so the police who have no experience or education in working with kids come in with the only tool they have, which is force. Um, so if, if you're a cop and you don't understand that this principal screwed up and didn't follow this child's IEP for their diabetes and when they're supposed to eat and your solution is to handcuff them and take them to jail, we have a really serious problem. But, you know, you, you have, I mean, as soon as that happens, you know, these families go on radar. With, with family services, you, you, I mean, you, you get assigned individuals to start looking like whether the family's fit to take care of the children at this point in time. Um, you, you look at the, the education disparities. You look at the, the disparities in um, job opportunities. You, you look at just the median wealth distribution. Uh, it's, it's, it's all slanted. And all, all of it comes down to where it's just it takes a tremendous amount of um, cost of investment just to be a black person to function. And the society, when you, when you start thinking about like, you know, from school, that stuff doesn't just disappear when you quit school. I mean, the stigmatization, the achievements, everything else that comes out of that, just the, the entire attitude that shapes you. Uh, at 18 years old, you're, you're, you're already defined by a lot of those um, experiences. But the same goes like, you know, with the incarceration systems, the juvenile authorities, uh, family services. Um, you know, heaven forbid you have like a young 25 year old parent that's out there trying to make ends meet, gets pulled over for going 15 miles and over on a speed speeding ticket. This is a court date. Now he gets arrested. Well, are they going to keep their job? No. How are they going to provide for their kid? Is, is the state or the county going to step in at this point in time and, and like take, take control of the kid or the family or any other things? Um, what about the estate? Is he going to lose their home? All the investments while they're just sitting there waiting for like a trial date for something as stupid as I didn't show up at your convenience and therefore I need to come back and be, you know, incarcerated in a pandemic. I mean, it's insidious, the levels of incompetence, and it's hard to dismiss them as anything more than just um, just malintent at this point. Um, because, I mean, there's a difference between like being part of a system and not realizing like, you know, what impact you might have. But when that's drawn to your attention, how your contributions and, you know, what the impact of that is, and you choose to disregard that, um, you, you, you've had your chance and ignorance is not something you can claim from that point forward. So you become part of the problem. Um, and my opinion is like, it's not just... The people who silently do their jobs, a lot of times that's complicit in enabling a lot of these things, which is why it's always important to look, I, I think, in my opinion, at the at the policy levels, at the leadership levels and see, like, what tone is being, um, you know, sent, you know, by the leadership. You know, what what do they measure and, and value and how is that enforced? You know, uh, a couple of years ago, I think police department, they had um, annual performance reports that were just a general form used by the city. Do you, do you I mean. Do you think the cashier would need the same level of training and milestones and earmarks and indicators that a police department officer would? I mean, you have to customize these to the workplace and you have to be able to hold certain indicators as this is our goal. So if you have some like individual officers who are like, you know, say, say they're policing at like um, a differential rate at like, say, four times the number of, you know, black individuals are pulled over or there's interactions with law enforcement, whatever that might look like. 
And that might be like at the same level, but it also depends upon a couple of factors that, you know, a data system could help you kind of tease out, like what's this person's beat? What's that beats concentration of a population? And start looking at these equalizing factors and look at, at an idea of, okay, you're operating in this area um, and you're kind of like, you know, setting the wrong standard for like what we want. So we need to scale it back. We need, we need that kind of responsive data monitoring and processes. Um, because unfortunately, a lot of people won't take the the mental energy to go in there and really do like the self assessment necessary to sit there and think: Am I doing the right thing, or what is the impact of this this mundane task that I'm actually performing? Um, because it does add up, um, especially at the institutional level. For sure, one one hundred percent. I mean, this. Well, first of all, I'm actually um, I go to University of Missouri. I'm not from. Missouri, I'm from Plainfield, Illinois, so a lot of the stuff, not that it doesn't happen in Illinois, but a lot of the stuff um, I've been learning about the city of Columbia is just stuff I haven't looked into at all before and just completely new to me. So, um, like, pretty much every piece of information I've found so far has been surprising. Um, I don't, I think you were here when you were talking about how much it can tell, too, and how, like, certain parts, how little we've been able to find. Mm -hmm. But, um, it's... No, we're, we're, we're getting to that point where, I mean, we need to grow as an organization. Um, un unfortunately, about two years ago, um, a few of us were like forced to sit up and pay attention at CPS. Um, we, we took on one advocacy course that really kind of got us even looking. We weren't even, I mean, CPS wasn't even on our radar. Um, Laura Wakefield's done a ton of work in that department for the last few decades, couple decades. Um, we rely heavily on, on her experiences and a lot of her, um, you know, friends and associates. Um, we're constantly in, in conversation with them, but yeah, it's, um, whew. Yeah. Two years ago, we, we, we took up CPS. CPD had always been kind of on our radar, some city council, but to actually look at this whole thing, like a systemic, just engine of how all these parts work together and trying to go in there and actually system systemically disrupt the certain points or to, uh, affect change in policy or practice. Um, we just need a much, much larger and dedicated organization. And, um, you know, we're hoping to grow that and we'll do the best we can in the meantime. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge gap that, um, frankly, I don't see any reason like why the city couldn't be providing this framework, but, you know, here we are trying to scramble for pieces, ask for legitimate data and build to model something that they should have been doing all along through a volunteer organization who has no staffing and no, um, no budget. <laughs> so, I mean, go figure it's, it's, it's ridiculous, but that's, that's how they get away with so much, so much junk It's just you know, these systems, the bureaucracy just kind of, just kind of lumbers along. And it's a matter of just trying to pile on so much that the inertia of trying to break through and actually participate meaningfully is just taken from so many people. And that's easy to do. Like one office, like I'll pick on CPS again, their stupid data portal. The fact that they still put that in a text, sorry, not text, but a picture format as opposed to like um, data. So when you go to download it, you can't download the data. It's just, it's ridiculous. But it's an extra step for anybody, anybody out there in the community who might want to look at that data. They all have to go through the same like half hour preparation to actually go through the programs necessary to extract this data out, and reformat into a position where all they had to do is just enable us to download it as a Excel spree, a spreadsheet. So, I mean, once that happens across multiple offices, multiple institutions, this lack of transparency is, is part of how they do business and get away with everything. Very much so. That's that's something we I think like the first day when we when we realized this was a weird topic that's we found that out day one. So, but um, real quick, if you so for this assignment, we have to turn in a source sheet. It's going to go to our professor, professor only. So can I get your phone number, Chad? Sure. So, yeah, it's five seven three three four four six four eight six. You um you cut out. Can you say the last? I got five seven three and then. Three four four. Okay. Six four eight six. Yeah, no, I I really really appreciate you guys like talking to me. I know I'm sorry for the confusion about getting the time to get on everything, but um, mm -hmm. I, you guys have been awesome. And I got the three links that you sent, Tracy. So no, when you get through with those, Race Mars Friends also has a policy brief that we did on community policing um, that we can shoot over to you. Um, I don't know if it's linked to our website, Chad, 
Um, but we also have a, a video library on our website and blog. So spend some, definitely spend some time um, looking at that. I think one pivotal uh, art, uh, piece that the Missourian did a while back was the Q&A with Chief Burton. I think that was um, September 2017. And so you can kind of see the mentality, right? Their ideology about policing relative to the public and their belief that police stops, et cetera, are, are ways to stop crime. Um, the, the CPD is really sort of um, a sprawling, we can do whatever we want kind of thing. And then there's the whole other aspect of the police unions, which has gotten very little oversight um, in this community in terms of the way that they um, shape um, and defend the um, actions of the police department. The CPR, CPRDB, the Citizens Police Review Board, um, as Erica mentioned, that People's Defense has been going to, that's another organization that has very little power, at least not power that they've recognized in themselves to insert themselves in these conversations. I think they're, they're trying right now. I'm going to put quotes around trying because my definition of trying is, um, I, I don't know, it's it's not not sufficient for for that. Erica, you might have some other thoughts about the CPRB than I do. No, I mean, you're right. They don't have the power, although they're supposed to be reviewing things, but it's really, um, once Chief Jones gets in front of the city council, um, it's like they listen to him more than they listen to the citizen review. And so I think that one thing they they're not going to re they're not is it that they're not going to record it? They changed it, or is that tonight? They're having a meeting on re, in regards to whether or not they're going to approve oh, for them record to the meeting. Yeah, because the meetings aren't recorded. So if you're not there in person taking notes and doing your own recording you're not you don't know really what goes on in that meeting and those meetings affect the community um you know they're supposed to affect the community but it's really once uh chief jones to like i said gets in front of the city council it's just like it's unless you know there's people that are there to comment um, there, it's just not, it's not going to go anywhere because he's probably going to stick with what has already been going on. I see this, this is kind of like, um, I, I think a, a pattern or a trend and I, I don't think it necessarily starts off as malicious, but when you have someone like, you know, the board acknowledge yeah, that, that, you know, you have a need, so you build or board or something like that, but then you disregard them. It's abusive. But that's that's you know across the board. Like the the only boards that you know Columbia's going to pay attention to are going to be like um, things that have to do with mostly the budget and things that that promote growth to the the community, which is not the stuff that we're talking about. You know, we start talking about equity and whatnot. But um, yeah, the CPRB, the police department should be beholden to input that they share with the council, and the council should be questioning the city manager publicly, what's the issue with this to make sure that we have kind of cross communication. And that's definitely not happening. And I mean, them reporting back to chief Jones is a joke. He's not going to take anything they have to say, um, under advisement, or if it, if it is, it's going to be like just out of, you know, a courtesy, but not, not a, out of anything meaningful. Yeah. So, I mean, it really, you have to look at these structures and, and just realize that sometimes they are meant to actually disrupt any kind of, um, issues that might actually emerge from cooperation. Um, if you look at the Human Rights Commission and you look at the um, Citizens Police Review Board, both of those are, um, they're, they're kind of an ethical oversight. And so they have been utterly neutered. Um, you, they have been provided, both of them with the same staff member that was just there to run the meeting in circles. Um, if anything, you, I mean, Having sat in on both of those committees, uh, and the vehicle stop committee, um, 
there are so many things that we are restricted from doing, like having a shared Google Drive. So we can't even have like a shared folder of materials that we use in helping deliberate. It's so ridiculous just how much restriction they give these groups. Um, so a lot of ways, you know, um, you know, yes, we want to continue to work with the groups because, you know, as much as we can kind of put pressure from within the system, that's great. But we'd be foolish to put half or, you know, even a quarter of our eggs in that basket because that's not going anywhere. Um, not not for the effort that we have to bring. That's that's what having that much of a restriction on is wild to me. Yeah, no, it, it really is. It's 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 utterly dysfunctional and it all has come back down to the whole sunshine regulations and they're being scared to, you know, share documents. I'm like, you can share the folder. That's fine. I mean, it just needs to be something that like we're giving permission to access that can be staffed on the, you know, city's servers. We're not asking for anything, you know, unique. But yeah, it makes it really hard. And, um, you know, if they're not updating the website, like if you go onto the Como.gov page and look at CPRB, um, I think they finally updated a lot of the documents and stuff like that we, we've been generating. Um, but it was like sitting stagnant for eight months, like where there was no no updates. There were no records of what we discussed for like the last six months or the articles or even the work we produced. So, yeah, it was it was really a. It's, it's sketchy, and I think it's like the legal advice that we're being given is um, way too risk averse. So I, I want to I want to add something that's important about the Citizens Police Review Board. So they they have a transcriptionist who transcribes the meetings, but there's no audio and no video of the meeting. So if you are blind, you you can't you won't know what's going on, right? Because it's not made in braille. So it's not accessible. Um, there are, we also had to, we had to argue to get the transcripts because the, the city staff person was doing minutes that were like one sentence, right? So there's no context to anything that was discussed. When we, when we pressed them for minutes, she got upset and said that it was too hard for her to type up minutes, right? So how this can happen i mean it's not just that it's for every boarding commission right um by the way at the school district they don't provide any minutes mm -hmm. if you know what's going on you have to stop and watch an entire meeting because they don't provide any minutes so somehow these guys have come to believe that um they only work for themselves and they'll take our tax dollars to get themselves paid but they're not willing to to do any more than the very 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 just you know un of course unfortunate you know so i put some um i put some documents in the chat for you Ben, right. to share with your um uh with your with your colleagues yep i i saved all five of them and, and uh those will i will definitely get passed on and look at for sure. I, I appreciate it. I'm going to share one more with you. This is just our policy brief. I hope this is the most updated one, but um, this goes to uh, your questions about policing. This is going to have a, a timeline and everything um, in here. So this should help you um, Yeah, thank, thank all three of you for uh, meeting. So I'm sure you're going to have a lot more questions as we'll get you going. Thank you. Hey, out of curiosity, did you have a recording of this meeting? I'm sorry, what? Did you have a recording of this meeting? Uh, I was taking the audio down. Yeah, yes, the audio, yeah. Is that oh. is that all right with both of you? It's not, this is only for a class project. It will not be published anywhere. No, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that you were recording the meeting. Just oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. So I, I do have a video recording of this meeting, and usually we use this for like just kind of internal analysis. Yeah. Um, do you have any problems with, with us publishing this? No, no, I do not. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, this is I, – I'm not taking a video recording. I just have an audio recording. Um, just use some of the quotes. But, yeah, this is for a, for a class project. So. That's fine. So let us know if we can help in any way. Of course. Um, I do think that um, if you don't have, uh, <laughs> I'll just do this real fast. It, it's important for you guys to look at the use of force reports. It's it's important to get, if you're gonna be talking about the chokehold, et cetera, 
it's good to um, have a, a deeper understanding um, uh, of of what use of force looks like in this in this community, right? And um, if we don't, if you guys are not, you know, are not aware of what those look like, it, it doesn't give you enough perspective on the chokehold. So um, I'm going to share uh, these with you. These are use of force, so that you can look at them. All right. There's some other stuff in there too. So you can see that these these issues are systemic, right? They don't not just like one-time things are filled over time, right? They become more entangled and complicated and all that over time. So, you know, this use of force thing with the chokehold just didn't come out of nowhere. Um, use of force has been an issue for a long time. Just like police stop disparities, the arrest disparities, the suspension disparities, disparities in um, rules and procedure, uh, tickets and things like that. Um, and, and this is a lot. We're seeing how um, how Colombia's policing um, harms the community through the data that our bail fund uh, collects. So there, you have to ask the question: Why was this person put in jail? Why were they stopped? And so we're seeing a lot of abuse. Seeing a lot of abuse. So again, the chokehold is really symbolic. <laughs> for the way that um, their, their unwillingness to ban a chokehold is really symbolic of how they feel about um, building a bridge and building trust and doing better policing with the community, which is to do nothing. Right. Yeah, I went ahead and dropped about um, five or six subjects in a quick chat. I think you may have seen that. Um, I, I think that honestly, it'd be, under your, it'd be in your best interest as a group to do a Google search on each of those terms and understand okay. how they work together and then review <laughs> Columbia police department policy 300 and tell me if you find anything wrong with the information, um, as presented. And you, you have to be careful with your sources, um, because there are a lot of authoritarian and disciplinarian organizations out there that like to interpret that and kind of throw out the justification for why they feel that they're, entitled to take certain approaches. But for example, like the law of armed conflict, that, that dates back to, um, you know, military operations. You should be able to find stuff. The UN is a good source of information on a lot of this stuff. Um, U.S. government, um, still the military has gone through all of this information and has a much more mature and charted out um, discussion on like the use of force and what, what escalation, de-escalation looks like. Um, not, not to mention there's a whole background of stuff that goes into that discussion that, um, like I said, just looking at CPD's policy, the way it's written, they're not getting it. Well, and also the police, the police as an, as an, as a institution, they do not have an agreed upon definition of de-escalation. So in other words, that means Columbia police, um, they make up their own rules for de-escalation, which may not mm -hmm. be reflective, reflective of best practice. Um, so I'm sending you that, I'm posting that article for you to, to ponder. Um, you'll find it really interesting because they also um, talk about, uh, use the military as an example of how they put together uh, training and practice and to try to use it with um, the police as well. So. Um, I would, I would, I would go further. Um, and Chad was really charitable about it. I would say that our police department, um, that they're the leaders are not learners. Um, they're not interested in how to do things differently or better. Mm -hmm. They don't know the. They don't. They're not. They're not keeping track of how, you know, what is going on in the industry that would help us do our jobs better and build trust. They seem to not be interested in them at all. I'm sure. And the younger, a lot of the younger um, police officers, they come from these small towns that they're, they're not used to diversity. They're not used to, um, if there are a few 
blacks or browns are you know low income in the area they, they probably don't speak out and so they're probably you they're used to the, the, the new police officers it's like they're used to not having um, question what they're doing and the police officers i've had them come to me and if they know my name they'll call me erica and i'm just like well are you in my neighborhood and they're like no and i'm just like so why are you calling me erica you should be calling me if you know my last name you need to call you need to respect me and call me by my last name because i'm going to call you officer whatever um and so they're <laughs> thrown shocking. off you have to break that that. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, it's it's shocking that you have to break it down for them <laughs> you know it's just annoying yeah it's just shocking to yeah and another uh thing that you may want to look up is <laughs> one uh another um, is graham's graham's law um that sometimes when people are trying to why the police get away with or they're able to when they, if they do make it to court why they get away with a lot of things the graham's law the graham law was not meant for the police but they use it it was meant for the people, but it, um, it's it's too much to actually go into. Just a few. That's, I guess I could type it into the. <laughs> I, I wrote it down. Okay. Uh, definitely look into it. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. Thank you guys. Anything else before I uh, head out? Nope. Alrighty. Good uh, luck. You your keen luck. Keep us posted, and if we can help in any way. Of course, yeah. If there's if um, anything comes up, we will for sure reach out. But yeah, thank you, thank you guys again, and um, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. All right, thank you, you too. Thank you. See you guys. Yep. Bye. Take care.